My name is Dennis Gill with the Americans of Wartime Museum. Today's date is 15 July 2018. I am at the Oatlands Plantation uh, in Leesburg, Virginia, and I'm conducting an interview with Dennis Boykin. Sir, if you could give us your name and where were you born? Uh, my name is Dennis Boykin. I was born in New London, Connecticut. Okay. And what uh, branch of the service did you serve? So I actually enlisted in the Navy right out of high school, but four years later I was out uh, kind of sort of trying to find my way through life and I ended up in the Arizona Army National Guard uh, as an artillery uh, fire direction specialist and found a home and ended up uh, going through the ROTC program at Arizona. I uh, got a commission as a lieutenant in the field artillery and retired from that eventually. Okay. And what war or conflict did you participate in? So uh, I w figured by the end of my career I was probably just going to be a cold warrior but while I was stationed in Germany uh, in 1990 uh, Saddam Hussein in Iraq, uh, the Iraqi army invaded Kuwait and we found ourselves in a very unique situation of going to a war we hadn't planned on. Uh, we had always planned on fighting the Soviets, well the Soviets were gone and the army said why don't you guys take your stuff to Bremerhaven and go to Saudi Arabia and participate in Desert Storm. That was not something we expected to do. Okay. Did you have, um, you have any other military veterans in your family? Uh, my father uh, I was a veteran of the Army Transport Service in World War II. My grandfather is a uh, retired Navy commander, previously retired as a chief and was recalled for World War II. Um, lots of other uncles and cousins who served in uh, lots of different services. Okay. So you say you enlisted in the Navy and eventually retired in the Army. Why the switch? Why, why did you decide on the Army? Well, uh, it was pure happenstance and I was uh, uh, divorced, uh, pretty much broke and living on a guy's sofa in Tucson, Arizona in 1981. And I had joined the National Guard because I needed the extra money and I'd gotten fired from my second or third job in a year and I was kind of floundering my way through life. And uh, I was getting extra drill time from the full-time training NCO at the artillery battalion in Tucson. Right. And one day he walked in early in the morning and saw my bicycle outside so he knew my car wasn't running again. And he knew I'd probably lost my job again. And he proceeded to just chew me out, threw me out, and say, go up to campus, sign up for classes. Stop wasting your life. So right. that was my first, but not, not the first, but one of many instances where a non-commissioned officer in the Army said, no, no, you need to get back on the straight and narrow. And so I got into the ROTC program when I went back to college, and I realized I liked it. I realized that I had missed the regular order and discipline of the service and a, and a clear path and a career. Uh, that I had kind of lost when I'd gone off in the civilian world. Why, uh, why did you end up getting out of the Navy? Um, well, there's usually women involved in that. And, uh, the lady I married way too early and yeah. way too immaturely uh, didn't like being in the service. So had I not been married there, I probably would have stayed in the Navy. Really liked it a lot, had a great time. Uh, but she wanted to do other things, and so we were off and running. And whereas I had been in San Diego in the Navy, um, gotten promoted, and life was looking pretty good, um, a couple of years later I found myself in Tucson, Arizona, uh, almost homeless, uh, without a job, and needing somebody to kick me in the tail and say, get moving. So you were stationed uh, and eventually find your way to Germany. Yep. You are stationed there for how long? So I went to Germany immediately after college, went back to Kansas. Uh, I, I went to uh, Germany in the uh, mid-80s, went back to Fort Riley, Kansas. I was in the 1st Infantry Division for five years. And in the uh, summer of 89, it was time to go to the uh, captain's course. So I went off to Fort Knox and then went back over to Germany again, where I joined the 3rd Infantry Division. And that's when we were uh, on a rotation to Grafenwehr, where I had just been told I was about to take command of a, of a service battery of 6th Battalion, 41st Field Artillery. Mm -hmm. And the next day we got alerted to pack up our stuff, go home uh, after a week of training, and go off to uh, the desert. So while you're in Germany, you, you obviously, you're training for the mission of what we thought would be the mission for right. to fight the Soviets. Um, so now you hear about you hear invasion of, of uh, Kuwait by Saddam Hussein. So what what what's the mood like? What are you guys thinking at this point? So we I all thought that you might be going over there. We all thought we were a sideshow. Uh, we all looked at it and said nobody really knew what was going on. So in uh, August of 1990, I was on a field problem, and I had to come home and bring home the uh, quarterly training brief. 
and uh, then we, uh, my wife said, you know, I'm not feeling very well. And so she was really feeling ill, and that's when I realized she was pregnant. Um, so when we went back out to the field again, we had a tough time justifying what we were doing for training because the Soviet threat was gone, the wall had fallen. Right. We were just kind of sort of in the same mode that you were in if you were a unit in the U.S., but we didn't have a clearly defined mission to deploy anywhere else. So we were kind of in a holding pattern. And as we watched the news, speculation was rampant. How we're going to go, we're not going to go. They deployed uh, uh, the 18th Airborne Corps. 24th Mech went, 18, you know, the 82nd Airborne went, 101st went, and we said, well, it's probably all they're going to need. They'll bring some guys from Fort Hood, and maybe three corps will go with 1st Infantry Division or 1st Cav. That's all they're going to need. So we really didn't expect much. And this was actually quite a source of tension uh, between myself and my boss at the time, the major that I was working for, because he was adamant that uh, the Russians were going to try and take advantage of this. And we all looked at him like he was crazy. He was, and we didn't get along very well. <laughs> After the discussions that we had, I made the mistake of actually stating my opinion. Uh, I learned not to do that too often with him. Let me backtrack for a minute. So you're, you're the, the U.S. military is focused like a laser, I'm assuming, on during that period of time, the 80s, 70s, 80s, yep. not early 90s, of the Soviet threat. So you're in the Army when the wall falls that threat seems to go away at least, or at least be diminished slightly. What, what, what's that like? With your so I check in in the summer of 1989. I, I finished, I went through the armor advanced course and actually it's Christmas of 89 and I go uh, down to the motor pool, meet my sergeant, go down and see my five track vehicles and one of them has concertina wire wrapped around the drive wheel. They just haven't bothered to fix that yet. And they've been out of the field for two weeks and I went ballistic. I, I said, what is th this? Is any, we're not ready for alerts. We're not ready for drills. The tracks are empty. There aren't any duffel bags in there. What's going on? I hadn't been in Germany in three years. Right. And the sergeant grabbed me. Sergeant first class page grabs me and he says, "Come here, Captain. <laughs> Let's go talk in the corner." And he said, "Sir, we don't do alerts anymore. We don't really have a mission anymore. We don't really know what we're doing here, and we can't get into maintenance to get that drive wheel fixed. And it's kind of a different pace here now." I, I realize you haven't been in Germany in a couple of years. So it was really a struggle for us. Um, I mean, we have a unit. We have to get ready to go somewhere. Where that where is, we have no idea what was going on. Um, Bosnia hadn't cranked up yet. Uh, none of that was an issue. It was 1990 and we were in 91, and we were in between wars. What is the mood like in the Army as far as, you know, training for what? Yeah. Preparing for what? So that's a problem. I have We have leadership coming down and getting involved in silly things. I have a boss who says, I don't like what, you know, we were staff officers in the headquarters of an artillery battalion. He didn't like what the headquarters battery commander was doing uh, on a variety of fronts. And so he was starting to get involved in that. Well, that's verboten. Staff officers do not get involved in commander's activities. So we had some rub, rub points about that. Uh, we were going to the field and training, but we really didn't know what we were training for, so we were just training because we're soldiers, and that's what we do. We go train. Um, lots of rub points, lots of kind of, hmm, and then as we watch the forces build up, um, the pre President Bush announces that he's going to start deploying units over there, and we were sitting around thinking, hmm, what are the chances? And this was a unique opportunity for the Army this is thinking going on at much higher levels above me, uh, that, hey, we're going to have to stand down 7th Corps eventually and just leave it with one Corps. We're going to have to stand down 5th Corps. Which Corps headquarters should we send to the war, send their units with them, and then we can stand them down as part of that action? So I know they were thinking about that beforehand. But at the, at the troop level, soldiers are soldiers. We're in the Army. We're going to train. We just go train. We just didn't know exactly what we were training for. We hadn't gotten into a, a tempo of training for operations other than war, which is what we used to call counterinsurgency operations. Um, we, we didn't think about any of that. We just we had a method of training. We had airland battle doctrine, and we would go follow that and right. go out and go shoot. So for lack of a better way to put this, is it almost like the Gulf War comes at just the right time for the Army? I mean, well, I can tell you it came at just the right time for Captain Dennis Boykin for very personal reasons. 
Um, I was I was at that point working for a guy who was ready to kick me out of the army, and that was a huge shock for me. Being prior enlisted, a, a Mustang officer, if you will, everybody I'd ever worked for had said, "Wow, you're you're head and shoulders above everybody else." And this guy found himself in the battalion commander's office getting counseled. And my friend, the, the adjutant, was sitting outside the door and actually heard it. And he said, look, I don't know why you and Boykin aren't getting along, but you need to go sort it out because everybody else says he's a great officer. And you're telling me you want to kick him out of the Army. What's going on? Meanwhile, the Army has not yet figured out, hasn't even begun to think about, what are we going to do now that the Soviet threat is gone? In fact, a lot of people in the Army weren't convinced it was gone. They, you know, sure the wall came down in 89, but this is just a year later. Years later in my career, I would go on to be part of the studies that would figure out what does Force 21 look like? What does the brigade combat team look like that replaces the divisional structure, which is now, thank goodness, gone away because they realized they need divisions. But in 1990, we were in a unique position of not really knowing what we we're going to do, but we had, a, we had a force that was fully trained to fight an army that was equipped very similar to the Iraqi army and trained very similar to the Iraqi army. So it was kind of like a hammer in search of a problem, except the problem really did come up. Right. So you, you eventually get the call and you guys deploy. What are, the, what are your feelings at this point? Well, I Given went... the threat and the right. enemy and all that. Well, the first thing they have, I mean, soldiers get very personal about the, the their wartime experiences. My first experience is we go to Grafenbeer for a shooting uh, training session. Grafenbeer is a training area in Germany. And so we deploy out to Grafenbeer. On the way out there, the battalion commander advises me that he's going to give me a battery command. So I breathe a big sigh of relief, got to Grafenbeer, called my wife, and I said, okay, there's light at the end of the tunnel. I'm getting a command. That means my career will continue. I'm getting out from underneath the idiot. That I, and he was, he's not an idiot, he's a really smart guy. We, right. just, we just butted heads. Yeah. He's really stubborn and so am I. And, and I said, this is good. The next day I went to the officer's club and I reserved the, uh, the dinner. That there's always an officer's dinner at the end of the training density. And then from there we would go to the other training area, Hohenfels, and I was going to go out with service battery and learn how they do uh, rearm, refuel, all the fixing and all the logistics stuff that I really liked. So I was pretty excited about that. Then we got a phone call. And we found out that A... We were no longer part of the 3rd Infantry Division. We were now part of the 210th Field Artillery Brigade. Who? <laughs> Who were those guys? Uh, secondly, we were going to be attached to the 2nd Armored Cavalry Regiment. you got to be kidding me. We're going with the Cav? And three, you got a week, you got nine days of training because we don't have enough transport to get you back to home station because the Cav's already rolling out. Right. Within 24 hours, the 2nd Armored Cavalry Regiment were loading up on trains. Oh, by the way, their mission, go to the border and defend Germany. Their mission today, load up on trains, go to Bremerhaven. Where? Bremerhaven. Put them on ships. Huh? And you're going to Saudi Arabia. Where? <laughs> and oh, by the way, you guys wait two weeks over there in the artillery battalion because we don't have enough transport. We ended up having engineer battalions from 5th Corps came all the way across Germany to pick up our howitzers and move them back. And oh, by the way, I forgot to cancel the officer's dinner. <laughs> so they called two weeks later and said, uh, who's paying for this chicken? So we had a little bit, yeah, there was a lot of schnitzel and chicken yeah. uh, that didn't get eaten that time. Uh, we had to pack up and move. And it was a really exciting time. The Army had sent advance parties over and then brought people back and said, okay, here's what you're going to expect. Here's what you've got to do. Here's what's different. By the way, you're not. You're still in woodland camouflage. Your vehicles will get painted when you get there, maybe. And the, the logistics requirements of getting an army with only one. There's only one division in the army in 1990 that has sand-colored paint on their vehicles, and that's the 24th Mech, which is now, uni uh, ironically, the third ID uh, at Fort Stewart, Georgia. Uh, there's only one unit painted that way, and some of 18th Airborne Corps is painted that way. Some of First Cavs vehicles, I think, were painted that way. But other than that. Uh, the 1st Infantry Division was painting vehicles at Fort Riley before they shipped them and painting them in uh, the port at Adamam after they got there. Uh, we went to a point where everybody said, okay, you've got to carry extra canteens. Here's what you have to worry about in the desert. Guys came out and gave training. Um, we were going to do a lot of local purchasing on the economy, we thought. We didn't end up doing that. Uh, so we had guys getting trained up to do that. A lot, a lot of really, really um, ferocious training. Oh, by the way, 
now starting to pack things up and get ready to go. Um, of course, my wife is pregnant at the time, so this is causing a little bit of concern. I'm like, okay, we're going to go. And uh, it's interesting enough, of, of, of all the 600 and something soldiers in that battalion, only one soldier tried to get out of the deployment. And it wasn't even really his idea. His wife talked to him right. to it. And he went with his broken foot that he dropped the frozen turkey on. Um, but he went with his broken foot. <laughs> that was it. Everybody else was up and ready to go. And we were fighting an army that was primarily equipped with uh, Soviet equipment and had been trained by the Soviets, although they fought mostly with British tactics. But their tactics, we didn't realize until after we actually faced them, their tactics had been developed in the Iran-Iraq War, which had only ended a few years prior to that. So they were not prepared to, to meet what they were about to meet. Right. They weren't ready for it. We didn't know that. We thought they would be. And you always assume the worst and right. hope for the best. How do you get? How do you get there? You go to Saudi. How so you, how do you get there? Uh, so we we load we load everything up on trains. They go off to Bremerhaven. They load up on ships. The SL sevens. One of them. One of the six or seven SL sevens actually breaks down. Um, they're borrowing shipping from everywhere to get all this equipment shipped over for us. Al Jubail, Saudi Arabia, a smaller port farther north uh, than uh, Adamam. Mm -hmm. And then we wait a week or so, and then we get on airliners. We fly to uh, Riyadh. Uh, we arrive in the middle of the night. We get on buses. We sit there for hours. We then the bus drives up to Al Jubail, where we roll into a tent city that the transportation guys have set up, and their units are just rotating through these trans uh, these tent cities. And it's a really carefully choreographed dance, where you roll in, and about two days later, a ship comes in, and you get all your soldiers and. We, we ended up marching soldiers down to the port. It was a heck of a march. And then after that, we rode buses. Um, and you're rolling vehicles off. And nobody's counting vehicles. You're just rolling, you know, go in, right. you know, drive a Humvee, go get in there, drive the Humvee, get off the ship. Right. And the idea being that we had to turn that ship, they tried to turn them in 12 hours. Um, 18 hours to 24 hours is probably more than norm. And you're driving off these row rows. And then there are these civilian car carriers showing up with Jeeps. It's like, people still have Jeeps? Well, yeah, in 1991. The National Guard still has Jeeps. Right. Some active army units still had Jeeps. And there's pickup trucks, and there's cuck Vs, and there are all these things. And you just go in, start it up, drive it. The keys are in the vehicle. If, if it's a cuck V, they're all the right. same key. And off they go, and you're parking them in these long rows, and you sort them out later. Uh, and it was a pretty interesting time as some of the units are going forward. One of the things that was really interesting, and we worry about in today's planning, because I'm still involved somewhat in, in the Army, uh, is that we had an uncontested port. So there was no, there were, uh, other than missile strikes later on uh, down in uh, Adamam and the Kobar Towers uh, bombing, other than that, uh, we were fairly uncontested. I mean, it was a peacetime environment. We rolled people in. They had paint booths set up. We quick, quick spray of cark paint, a lot of training in chemical suits because we knew the Iraqi army had chemical weapons. Uh, we spent a lot of time in our mob suits. And then uh, off to our, our assembly areas. Off, we were off and running out to the war, which then didn't happen for another two months. <laughs> two months of, okay, what's next? So from the time you get orders to go, how long does it take you to get, get to uh, Saudi Arabia, roughly? Boy, that's a good thing. We were in Grafenvir in October. It was, I think, the middle of October. So it was about 60 days. Yeah, about 60 days. It was, uh, we had a big splash, a big party the first week in December, and then I think our flights were like the 14th of December, I think we were in, in Saudi Arabia, and it was sometime in October, um, first or second week in October, that we were notified for deployment. And the, the other units in the 2nd Armored Cav Regiment were actually there. They were flying within two weeks. Okay. And you're combat ready how long? How long does it take you to get combat ready? Oh, I think we were... Depending on the, we were probably 50 to 60 percent ready a couple of days after we got there. Um, within a week, we were probably 80 to 90 percent ready. Um, but we had no idea. This is one of those first battle scenarios where almost everyone in the unit is a neophyte. Uh, unlike the Army I served in in the early 80s when I came back in um, after uh, college, where most of my senior officers and, uh, and almost all the NCOs were Vietnam veterans, mm -hmm. almost all of them. Uh, the sergeant major of our battalion was a Vietnam vet. The battalion commander uh, was not a combat veteran; had never seen combat. Um, nobody, no other, no, none of the other officers had seen combat. Um, I'd seen the coast of Vietnam, but I didn't go in. 
So I, I was as close as it got, right. uh, other than the sergeant major. And I think we had two first sergeants who had, who had seen combat in Vietnam very early on. Uh, and we'd, we'd, one guy who had been in Beirut um, supporting the Marines went in 1983. That was it. So we were pretty green and pretty nervous. Now we had a corps commander who was missing part of his leg from a landmine in Vietnam. And Freddie Franks wasn't scared at all. He just walked around and talked to everybody and said, no, don't worry about it. The guy's trained. Everything's going to be fine. And the old man with half a leg, he says it's okay. Must be okay. okay. Yeah. Is there a thought when you guys get there that, that Saddam at some point is going to back down? You're never going to fire a shot? That's a good question. I don't know that we thought that. We got very little news over there, which is different than soldiers rolling out in theater today. Right. I mean, they're up on Instagram and Facebook, and they're getting news. on They have network cap capability all the time, unless they're rolling out outside the wire. When we rolled into the desert, the only news we got was the BBC. That was it. I had a shortwave radio. My wife went out and bought it for me while we were at Grafenvirs. As soon as she got there, as soon as we got the orders, she went out and bought this little shortwave radio. And I was about the only one in the battalion that had one. So I was sending out news from the battalion fire direction center. I was typing up stories and sending them out. Right. Battalion commander made me stop doing that. He said, that's not officially sanctioned news. Knock it off. OK. Um, but we really didn't expect much. The, uh, the, the, the rhetoric that was coming across the British news right. was pretty strong. So we really weren't expecting him to back down. We really thought we were going to have to go do something. Now, the more practical guys were looking at it going, does he realize what's over here? I mean, he's going to see all this. He's going to know what he's up against. Well, truth of the matter is he didn't see anything. He had no idea what was sitting on the other side of the port. He had no idea of the hell that was about to rain down upon him. He, clueless. And then starting in February, the United States Air Force and Navy made sure that he didn't see anything, talk to anybody, know anything. His communications, from about day three of the air war, his communications were virtually nothing. The only thing they got through was what they had on hardwired landlines, where they were sending couriers back and forth to the forces in the field. So what, what do you guys say, there's a, there's a lull now when you get yep. there and before the invasion starts. What, what are you doing at this point? So we actually went out and did some training. Uh, the Saudi army set up a, a, a range, and we went out and we actually fired artillery, and we did some maneuvering, we did some training, and then we went to a meeting, and that's when it was probably three weeks before the war starts, or probably about a week before the air war started, actually, so maybe five weeks before, uh, that we go to a briefing and we, we see the plan. And that's the first time we saw the big left hook. Uh, it's what everybody expected. It's what we thought we were going to do. We saw all the forces. I mean, you can see the guys that are turning. You're going out the trans Arabian Pipeline Road out to the west, and everybody else is heading north, and they're turning off early, and then we're going and going and going and going and going out to the west. And we're like, what the hell are we doing out here? So finally, we, we got some maps, and we looked, and we said, yeah, okay. I know where we are. Right. And they're down there, and we're over here to the west. Yeah, it, we can see this one coming. And then we got briefed on the plan, and they said, this is where you're going. You're not going to Kuwait. You're just going to circle it. You're going to, the original plan was to take us all the way to Basra, just encircle the entire country. Uh, but it was a force-oriented mission, and they told us, you're going to go after the Republican Guard. That's your job, uh, and this is where you're going. And we figured there were guys downrange already. We figured they already had people snooping, or, snooping around down there, and they did. And the Special Forces guys were already out there causing trouble and, you know, taking notes and right. sending messages back. But we figured what our mission was going to be, and then we realized what we were going to have to do. We watched the, the logistics guys starting to stockpile things out to the west and trying to be covert about it. It's hard to be covert with tractor-trailer trucks. But uh, it, the, uh, a lot of people don't realize the rear area security in Saudi Arabia was very serious. Um, the Saudi National Guard was out patrolling the roads, and if they saw civilian vehicles, they pulled them over, and they weren't nice about it to make sure that there weren't Iraqi agents back there. Once we saw the plan, we realized, whoa, this is serious. And we had no idea the size of the force that was coming out until we started getting newspapers. And we realized how many units were coming out there. And, we were. and the other thing that really made things hard for anybody who was back there trying to count noses was the United States Army task or organized. We came out of the 3rd Infantry Division. We had a brigade of the 3rd ID went with 1st uh, Armored Division. You wouldn't have known. So you're going to see all these different bumper numbers because the Army loves putting the, bump, the unit on the bumper. If you were counting noses off the bumpers, you were probably telling the Iraqi Army that there were nine or ten divisions back there when there were only six. 
but he never got that word. He never really understood what he was in for. Um, what is what is the reception like in Saudi Arabia? Uh, we had very little contact with civilians. We had uh, we were up at Al Jubail. We had a lot to do with the Marines because the Marines were that was their main port of entry. So we heard all the stories about the uh, the mullahs um, getting upset with the female Marines taking their shirts off and stuff like that. But we had very little contact with the civilian population. We just went out to the desert, got ready to do our thing, and then what was it, the twenty third or February, we're ready to kick off. Um, how do you keep in contact with your family? You've got a pregnant wife back home. Um, so that was one of the interesting things is they, AT&T set up all these, these mobile satellite uh, payphone stations. You pick up the phone and call. Um, they didn't go to Germany. They only went to the United States. So I talked to my mom once a week. Um, I said, okay, call Joyce and tell her this, but uh, sending letters and everything. Meanwhile, my partner in the fire direction uh, center, his wife is a, a lieutenant in the Army, and, and she and some of the other wives are going over, and we're eating better in the desert than we've ever eaten. I gained weight over there, because they're sending all these care packages. Right. My mom's sending baklava, because she makes baklava. And I'm, the, I'm the, the single most popular guy at mail call. People would come knock on the door of the fire direction center, hey, Captain Boykin, did you get any baklava? <laughs> we're, we're keeping in touch with the family, and we're letting them know. And of course, my mom's already sent one over right. in 1942, so she's like, oh, this is not good. <laughs> I'm not real thrilled about this. So it's probably better that I could talk to my mom. And my wife is with the family support group, so she's hearing about that. So they're, they're keeping in touch, but it's not as, you know, there's email was kind of a new thing. Right. They were just thinking about it. AOL had set up, or uh, Prodigy had set up some stations that you could do email. Uh, what's email? We, we didn't know what email was. Right. Um, you, you kind of touched on a little bit, you know, with all these groups supporting the troops. It was completely different than what happened in Vietnam. You guys have, I, I know you, a lot of you guys weren't familiar with Vietnam from a first hand, you didn't have any first hand knowledge, but you knew that the troops weren't yep. treated well. Um, how were you guys treated, or how did, what was the perception of, of what Americans were thought of the war and how you guys were treated? Overall? Well, we actually talked about that before and after the war. Desert Storm veterans have talked about it a lot. Um, it, it, the country went out of their way to go the opposite direction. I mean, it was very obvious that, that people looked at him and said, oh, my God. I don't necessarily agree with it. A lot of discussion in 1991 and 92. I don't agree with the mission. I don't agree where we're going. We're going to war for oil. Yeah, it's hard to argue that. Uh, I don't agree with that but I support my troops. A really common statement. I don't agree with the war, but I support the troops. It was like everybody's going out of their way not to go back to 1969 and 1970. Now, I went to college in 19, I started college in 1981 and wore an ROTC uniform and I got yelled at. I had people call me out and call me names. That was 1981, yeah. but it's a college. I mean, we were seeing the beginning of colleges becoming liberal bastions. Um, and so we were treated really, really well. Everybody kind of went out of their way to do that. Um, so, th so tell us about the war kicks off. Tell us about that. What, so were, you, what were you guys doing? What was your mission at that point? So by day three of Desert Storm, uh, I would tell you that it was the most boring evolution of my life, and I'd had training exercises far more difficult than that. We would get up in the morning. Um, stand two would be at 4.30 a.m., you know, about half the battalion's awake anyway. And, right. and when, then we would get ready to start moving, and we were in this cycle for the last two months. Up at 4.30, ready to go at 5. Um, couldn't believe I needed my parka in the desert. It was 78 degrees in the morning, and I was freezing because it was on its way to be 110, right. 115. By the time we left, it was 119 the day we left uh, in May of 91. We'd see the bombers come back overhead. We'd see a, a four-ship formation come back. We'd see another four-ship formation come back. Then we'd see a three-ship. Oh, go, crap. Did they take off with three? That's not good. We actually watched refueling over our heads. Uh, then we kick off. We go across the berm. We run into some scouts. It's no big deal. By the third day, our biggest mission was um, taking prisoners. You know, we're, we're taking crates of water and, and dropping them on the sand with these guys and telling them, go that way, go south. And they were just walking. We didn't stop to pick them up. We just kept going. Those were our instructions from General Franks. Just keep moving. Move, 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 move north, and then start curving east. And then the tone of voice started changing. And then it was, uh, guys, uh, we think we're so... And that was the point at which we started running up against the flank of the Republican Guard. Or we thought it was their flank, but they had already repositioned. They knew we were coming. So by the time the Talakana and Medina divisions 
uh, had were in day two of the ground war, they knew we were coming and they were resetting to run into us. So we're, at this point, we have an artillery battalion direct support to the 2nd Squadron of the 2nd Armored Cav Regiment, and we are the lead squadron. 2nd Squadron is leading the entire corps. There's nobody in front of them, and we're right behind them. We have 32 tubes of artillery. They have their mortars. Um, they've got attack helicopters. You know, life, and then the 20, what was it, the 26th of February, as we, we go to the 6.5 Easting, and we go to the 6.8 Easting, and course says stop at the 7.0 Easting, we're gonna, we'll pass 1st Infantry Division through you. And they said, well, we wanna go a little farther, okay, go to the 7.2 Easting, and then we go to the 7.3 Easting, and that's when we get into it. And that's what becomes, what will be written up in the history books is the Battle of the 7.3 Easting, where we run into the better part of three or four brigades um, in different times between 2 o'clock in the afternoon and 10 o'clock at night. So the, rewind just a little bit, the, 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 the Iraqi soldiers that were walking, that was a result of the air campaign, correct? They just had it, had it, had enough. And so the Iraqi soldiers that were, were walking, the, these were mostly guys that we had, the, the units had kind of brushed by, mm -hmm. uh, or they were guys in supply units. And we just kind of, you know, pass them on. Um, remarkably little impact from the air war on the combat units. Supply, they did a great job on the supply trains. These poor guys were out there with very little supplies. But the combat units were virtually untouched. They learned something very interesting. They would take a 55-gallon drum, fill it up with sand, pour diesel fuel down in there, and every morning some private's job was to go out there and light off the fuel. So as the Air Force rolled in at 8 o'clock in the morning, they're at 10,000 feet because they had a hard deck. They wouldn't come below 10,000 feet because of the air defense they were afraid of. And they look down and they say, oh, tank burning, tank burning, tank burning. Oh, yeah, they've already been shot up and they pass them by. Most of the units that we ran into in the first two divisions that we engaged at 7-3 Easting were at 95% strength. And, but unfortunately, they were using the tactics. By the time they, we, we blew through the first two positions really quickly. And this is the story that uh, Lieutenant General McMasters tells all the time as he's talking about 7th Easting is going through these units and, and killing 10, 12, 14 tanks with no losses and 2nd Squadron only loses one Bradley in the whole fight. But then they started advancing on us. The, the other units now, at this point, the Iraqi army is now repositioning. We thought to go home, they were actually repositioning to cover their flank. And now they advance on us. But they advance at a walking pace. And this now becomes a real scary time because you're watching units at six or seven kilometers away, so you can't touch them yet. You can call artillery, but you can't touch them yet with your tanks. And they deploy the tanks out, and the soldiers dismount, and they get online, and they start walking. That was what they did in the Iran-Iraq War. And some of the units did that. Now, some units, especially the Republican Guard units, maneuvered on us. They stayed mounted, and they maneuvered. The problem was their weapons couldn't reach out and touch us. And then, probably close to dinner time, the two lead troops of 2nd Squadron run out of bullets. And, and uh, the phone rings in the fire direction center, and I'm shooting missions right and left. And I grab the phone, and it's the assistant three, Andy Glenn, who was also had been in uh, Fort Riley with me. And there were a bunch of us in the unit that had been together for many years. And he said, hey, they just went black for main gun for Eagle and Ghost Troop. I said, got it. So I just shifted priority fires to those guys and went to a continuous fire mode, which I got commended for later on, but it seemed like an obvious thing to do. Your two lead units are in contact. They're running low. They're below 10% main gun. That's 20 million, you know, 25 for the Bradleys, uh, tank rounds for the Abrams. And we said, okay, we'll just start shooting direct fire. So I, I told Andy, I said, tell Brian uh, Birdwell in the AWOC, uh, start running ammo forward because I'm going to go to continuous fire. And nobody called me back and said no. So I said, okay, it must have been the right decision. Uh, and we started shooting, and we put out about 1,000 rounds in, in, in the course of that battle. I mean, we shot a boatload of, of ammunition, but we covered them. Uh, and then later on that night, once that stopped, later on that evening, we passed the 1st Infantry Division through. And, of course, in one of those ironic moments in, in combat, the next morning we're up at 4.30 in the morning. I got a little bit of sleep, and we link up with the 1st Division, and now we're going to move into the northern end of Kuwait. And the order comes down that 6th Battalion, 41st Field Artillery, is going to be reinforcing 4th Battalion, 5th Field Artillery, which I had spent the last five years in that battalion. 
and I, I knew practically everybody in that battalion. So I grabbed the code book, got their frequency, keyed it up, heard the S3 talking, knew who it was, and I said, uh, and they use call signs, and they're calls, they, they're the same call signs since World War I in the first division. And I said, hey, Dungeon 3, Steel 2-2, two, two. and he said, oh, good, Steel, glad to hear from you. Here's what we're going to do. And all of a sudden, the commander jumps in. Steel 2-2, two, two, this is Dungeon 6, and you need to understand that. And he just starts going off on me, because I've known this guy since he was a major. He's a great guy. A little bit prone to hyperbole, but a, but a great guy. And... I had spent so long in that battalion, I had been the fire direction officer of that battalion for almost three years. So he gives, finishes telling me these instructions about how we have to link up and you need a copy of our SOP, and we're totally digital, and that was the first war where we actually did digital fire control. And he stopped talking for a second, I keyed the mic, and I said, Dungeon 6 is still 2-2, I wrote your TAC fire SOP, so now that you know who you're talking to, sir, can we get on with business? <laughs> and Sergeant Woods looked at me and he said, Captain, I don't know if you're about to get fired or get a medal, <laughs> one of the two. <laughs> yeah, and the next, next thing I hear on the radio is Dungeon 3, this is Dungeon 6. I have complete confidence in Steel 2-2. Go ahead and turn things over to him, get the talk moving, Dungeon 6 out. And we went on with the war. Right. And life went on. It was just one of those funny little moments here in the middle of a war with half a million people. And right. You bump into the guy you've been working for for the last five years. And uh, we went off and we went up to Safwan. Uh, and then the war ended. And it was it was all over, and it was kind of a it was kind of a it was kind of like nails on a you know fingernails on a chalkboard. It was like we were all geared up, we were rolling. The Seventh Corps was moving. I mean, this was the Seventh Corps of Lightning Joe Collins when he was in the Army, not when he was the Chief of Staff. Um, rolling across Europe, you know, just blitzing through everything, and it's what we have to stop. No, no way! We're, we're, hell, let's go to Baghdad. Right. I mean, what are we stopping for? What do you mean we have to stop? Who the hell is this guy Schwarzkopf, and why is he telling us to stop? I don't think it's his idea. Really? We have to stop? And then there we were. And, and literally, you felt like you were just hitting the shoulder straps in the airplane, you know, when you hit the deck. Right. It's like, okay. What are your duties specifically in combat? So as a fire direction officer, you're the one receiving calls for fire from the forward observers. So my job is to figure out, as a battalion fire direction officer, you have, in the current organization, you have 24 guns of 155 um, in a mechanized unit. Uh, the light units have slightly fewer. And then I had the HAL battery of, this, of the CAV squadron. So I had 32 howitzers responding to my fire commands. Kind of a heady feeling when you're a captain right. in the Army, uh, right. and you're not making a whole lot of money, but by golly, you can blow up some sand. Um, and you can you can cover your friends. I mean, you can take care of your buddies, and yeah. you can and get them covered there. But my job is to set the priority of fires through the battle to call over to the battalion commander and say, hey, this is what I see going, or have him call me and say, this is what I want you to do. This is what I want you shooting. This is what you ought to be prioritizing. You have a limited resource, and you're trying to fire those. We, you're trying to allocate those resources accordingly. We had a briefing before we went across the berm and started the war where a, who, a major, who was the uh, operations officer of the 2nd Squadron, who would become famous later on for doctrinal thinking and writing, um, briefed very brashly that he was going to outrun his artillery support and he wasn't worried about it. And General Franks very kindly said, that's a nice idea, Major, but no, you're not going to do that uh, because you might run into a sandstorm and you can't depend on those attack helicopters you're so proud of. Um, most of the Battle of 7-3 Easting was conducted in the sandstorm. So the one thing I learned out of that that really stuck with me was the voice of experience. There's no substitute for combat experience. And the Army has a lot of that today, but in 1991 we had very little, we had very little experience. The other thing that really stuck with me was that war as we, that, that was probably the last great armored formation across the desert fight we'd ever see. But there were a lot of lessons in there that we continue to use to this day about how information flow is so important. We had remarkably little information at the forward edge, forward edge of the battle area. Right. Remarkably little. Um, and that today is very, very different. Are you guys, um, are you in mop gear when you're advancing? Yeah, pretty much the entire time. I mean, we just you just learn to live with it. And it, the, the weird thing was is that it was so freaking cold at night. I mean, it got down to 80 degrees. <laughs> and you'd wake up wearing every bit of clothing you had because your body had become accustomed to it. I mean, we would put, we would take liter bottles of water, 
put a wool sock around it, soak it down with water and put it in a hole in the ground in the shade and it would cool down to you know 75, 80 degrees and it tasted like ice water. It was wonderful. Right. Evaporative cooling would pull the heat out of that bottle of water. Right. So you'd do anything you could do to stay out of the sun yeah. um, and, stay, and stay warm in remarkably pretty good living conditions. We got, sh uh, we'd, I think I went two weeks without a shower once and then they had these, the Saudis contracted with a company to build these portable showers. They were metal, uh, wooden stands with two by fours with a metal tank on the top. And you just had to go in and fill the wooden tank. Well, we spray painted ours black. So we had hot showers. Because once right. that water said, yeah, you didn't yeah. take a shower in the morning. You waited until the middle of the day and everything had settled down. And you go out and take a shower. Right. And uh, so we lived pretty well. The food was awful, yeah. but I mean, we were eating first generation MREs, which have an interesting effect on your body. <laughs> and we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> um, the threat of chemical, the chemicals being used, was that something you guys, were, I mean, I know you were concerned, obviously. We, were very, year, we took it very seriously. Right. Chemical alarms went off all the time. And we were constantly putting our masks on and living in them. I think I went an entire day and a half once where I, I didn't take the mask off. I was actually using the drinking tube and drinking. We didn't eat um, because chemical alarms kept going off. Um, the VA assures me that I was not I was not exposed to any chemical weapons at all. Um, the intel guys assure us that they did not find any evidence of that, but the alarms kept going off. We think maybe the alarms were failing. We're not sure. They may not have been able to handle the heat. But we certainly lived in our mop gear a lot. And it was always, you never went anywhere without it. If you were allowed out of it, you had it with you right there. Right. Now, when the alarm sounds, what are they using to trigger that alarm? How, does, how do they know? I know now, the, the individual I soldiers know. got, is it M5 tape? That yeah, they but, the, but there are alarms mounted on vehicles. So each company size element is going to have two or three alarms in it. And uh, at the headquarters, we had a couple. So, you know, when I'm set up in the fire direction center, I could hear the alarm go off. And, and then uh, everybody's scrambling to grab their masks. And it got to the point where it's just routine. We just throw on the mask, put on your gloves, right. tuck everything in. And, and I'm inside an air conditioned, filtered uh, shelter on the back of a five ton truck. So I was feeling pretty comfortable. But if I was outside, because right. Dave was on shift, because we switched off, um, and it was Dave's section, I, I got stuck in the section to go to war. And he was actually junior to me, but the boss said, hey, He's been running the section for a year, doing a good job. What do you uh -huh. think? And I said, just leave him where he is. I'll work for him. And uh, that worked out well. But yeah, if I was off shift, uh, you had your mask right there. Usually used it as a pillow. Right. So it was right there underneath your sleeping bag. And all you had to do was reach out of your bag, grab the pillow, and go. So once you guys advance as far as you're going to advance, there's, a, I assume, a ceasefire at some yep. point. What is your mission at that point? What, what's going on? So then the refugee mission comes into play. So I went back to, there's a facility called King Khalid Military City out in the middle of the desert. It's apparently really large now, but it was just getting built then. And we set up a redeployment assembly area back there, and then that's where all the trains and the logistics guys, they were consolidating all of the army units into the middle of the desert, basically to keep them away from the coast. And the army made a decision at that point that they were going to leave a lot of equipment there. We left our entire battalion set parked in the desert. They eventually came back and policed it all up and put it somewhere, but, uh, and then shipped it home. They didn't put in the prepositioned sets. Big issue with the Saudi government is whether or not they would allow us to station equipment there. Now we just station ships in the Gulf. But we, uh, I went to the rear, and the battalion went forward to assist with refugee operations, because a lot of refugees in, in all the Basra, uh, the uh, Basra Baghdad Highway along the, the Euphrates River. Mm -hmm. So those guys went north, and then every morning at 6 a.m. I got, I was on the uh, uh, single sideband radio talking to the battalion XO, and he would copy down part numbers of the stuff that he needed. Then I would traipse around all the different places, find the parts that he needed, and then I would. Uh, I mean, there's nothing to do with a fire direction officer when the war's over. Right, right. Yeah, you got nothing to do. So my, I was a parts runner. I became a logistician, which is funny because I now look, work for the Logistics Management right. Institute, and I do logistics. Um, I'm not a logistician by trade, but I became one in Desert Storm. And that was pretty much our mission until we all came back, got cleaned up. And by golly, we got issued our desert fatigues uh, the day before the war kicked off, and we never wore them. But when the war was over, we pulled all those chocolate chips out, put our name tags on them, put our shoulder patch on, and we redeployed in our chocolate chips. Never wore them in combat, though. Interesting. Yeah. We went to, and, and there was actually a PSYOP campaign, I understand, 
where they were dropping leaflets and they were warning the Iraqi army that the guys in the woodland camouflage, they were the guys who had been trained to fight the Soviets. They were the ones you really needed to worry about. Um, okay, you know, I'll buy that. So when you when you finally ship out, you go so, back to Germany, I assume. So we went back to Germany. Um, it was kind of it was kind of interesting um, going back to Germany rather than going back to the U.S. The guys went back to the U.S. I mean, flags flying, banners right. unfurled, bands playing, parades. There's a parade, the ticker tape parade in New York City. Not for us. No, no, none of that. Um, but the Germans were really interesting. Uh, my my uh, our redeployment date was a week prior to my daughter's birth. So the battalion commander's wife is telling my wife that she's insisting I come home on one of the first flights. Well, the battalion commander's having none of this. He's not, he said, no, no, Boykin's my arrange things here guy. I'm not letting him go. And he said, right. well, some babies have been born without their dads before, you're fine. Uh, I said, yes, sir, no problem. Um, but he was getting pretty nervous because his wife was getting on his case. He told me years later, I just saw him uh, two years ago at a, at a function, and he said, yeah, Maria was really harassing me about that. I was afraid that your, your, your baby was going to be born, and then I was going to hell to pay for that. Uh, but we, uh, we finally got everybody back into King Khalid Military City. Next thing you know, it's on buses. We go to the airport. We get on a, on a charter flight. We're going home. Uh, that's a weird reaction. <laughs> I didn't expect that. We uh, <laughs> we got back to Nuremberg, and uh, I just remember the battery commander come running up to me when we got home, and uh, he said, "Your wife's over there." She's too pregnant to move, so you have to go over there. Give me your pistol, because you're the last weapon I have outstanding besides the battalion commander. You and the commander are the only two I need, because to a commander, weapon security is everything. Right. So I handed him my 45, and I went over and grabbed my wife. I don't know why I reacted that way. I haven't thought about that in 30 years. Wow. And... Uh, <coughs> Next morning, we went to the PX in Nuremberg, and I ate an entire pizza. <laughs> they warned us not to do that. They said, right. just don't go out and gorge yourself. And I said, that I'm going to do it anyway. So I went to, yeah, we went and got a pizza, and uh, <clears throat> we had to buy a crib, you know, a car seat, and all the yeah. stuff you have to have when you're having a baby, because a week later, we had a baby. So, yeah, it was a big deal. It was a big deal. And then the Germans threw a party for us. I was like, what? Yeah, they did. The mayor of Kitzigan put together a party, and they came out, free beer and everything. And they wanted to welcome us home. I said, well, that's pretty cool. Now, the Germans had units as well, correct? Or no? Ooh, they, they, didn't, they didn't send anybody. They provided some material support okay. because we had bought the German uh, chemical reconnaissance vehicle, the Fuchs, okay. the Fox. So we had bought that. So they provided a lot of support, um, but it was not mentioned in public. You know, there's a huge issue in Germany with them sending forces to Afghanistan years later because of the, um, uh, the whole World War II experience, and the Constitution does not allow them to deploy combat forces. They, I mean, it's, they're prohibited by law from doing that. So it's, been a, it's like Japan has the same issue. So they're very, very touchy about that. But yeah, they were really good to us. And then the uh, the uh, Second Armored Cav Regiment threw a party and made sure that we came up. Except by that point, I was already moving on to my next unit. Um, I had been scheduled to take command, which was the next step in my career. That command was no longer that we were standing the battalion down. Uh, we left all our equipment in the desert. The battalion was no more. We were disbanding. So I had already uh, interviewed and was going out to find my next uh, unit so that I could get a command because it looked like I was now three years away from a command and as a captain you have to do that so yeah. I ended up getting two commands out of the deal the one that I had interviewed for I drove up to Frankfurt and I interviewed with the battalion commander he's like why are we having this interview I have five captains in my battalion the five battery commanders I have nobody else right. you're in besides which I think the S3 is going to have to go on leave so you're going to be at three for a while 
Uh, that unit got stood down early also, so I had to go on to the next command. So I got two commands as a captain, so I did fine after that. But it was a very, very hectic and turbulent time. Um, and obviously a very emotional time. <laughs> I, I hadn't thought about that in a while, but I came home to a pregnant wife, and the baby was born a week later, and my life was never the same. Right. How do you think, um, how did the, so you were in the Army before the war? Mm-hmm. Focuses on the Soviets. You're now past that. The Gulf War is now over. You were in the army another what, eight nine well, years. Yeah, another that. yeah, another nine years how after the, that. How did the how was the army different in that period than it was prior to the war? So the army really struggled for the first couple of years. Um, army promotion boards were instructed when and schooling boards were instructed they were not to give preference to combat veterans. A lot of people don't realize this, but in the nineties. It wasn't fair, air quotes, not fair that people who didn't go to Desert Storm would get preference over people who did. So the Army deliberately discriminated against, because that's how the Army does everything. Yeah. If they tell you not to give preference, well then you're going to get discriminated against, because the Army always goes too far in the other direction. It's like in 75 when we drew down from Vietnam. They went too far. So if you look at the guys who were colonels when I first came on active duty, the, there were a lot of boat sixes who had no business being full colonels. But the year groups were so thin that you, you had higher promotion rates. Same thing happened after 1991. We drew down too much. I actually got selected for lieutenant colonel in uh, the 90, at the 99 uh, board, even though I hadn't finished all my qualifications because, again, we had drawn down too far. We'd gone through the voluntary separation bonus and all those things to draw the size of the force down. Uh, the Army, I knew several Desert Storm veterans who didn't get selected for Command General Staff College, like myself, uh, with outstanding records. And we looked around and we, we talked to the guys who sat the boards and they said, they told us, guys who went to Desert Storm don't get an extra break. In fact, you need to be really nice to the people who didn't get to go. I'm like, hmm. you kidding me? You had all these guys with combat experience. Yeah. These are the guys that understand how it works. What, what, what are you doing? Right. But the, it was an interesting reaction. And then tactically, as we started looking at, at, the, at, at how tactics and procedures would, would work, we realized that there weren't any more peer competitors. The Army went through a real struggle with the Force 21 process, Army After Next, which I actually worked on, and then the Brigade Combat Team Studies, which the aforementioned uh, Squadron S3 would be a huge part of that, as he wrote a book uh, claiming that the Army was completely dysfunctional and should not be organized in divisions. And, he took, and the Army went directly towards a very much looking like regimental uh, operations in the 1930s which doesn't work either, so we're back to a divisional structure. But the Army really struggled with that. It was hard for him because we were looking at operations other than war. Uh, okay, what the heck does that mean? And then Bosnia comes in, so peacekeeping operations. Well, it's the only game in town, so I guess we have to train for peacekeeping operations and humanitarian missions. And in 1996 and 97, I am part, in 98, I'm part of studies where we're postulating that non-nation state actors terrorists will become a huge problem. Tremendous institutional resistance to discussing non-nation state actors. The army didn't want to hear about it. The idea that there would be a terrorist attack on American soil was foreign to most people in 1999. We pointed to the World Trade Center bombings in 94 and they said, yeah, that was nothing. It barely, it barely blackened the paint. What right. are you talking about? And the last war game I worked on in 99, we were postulating um, off the coast of Somalia and in the Straits of Malacca, piracy targeted against oil tankers and um, terrorist attacks in Azerbaijan that were directed from the United States. We got huge pushback on those scenarios. They would never happen. Well, two years later, unfortunately, we were right. Um, how do you think your wartime experience has affected your life? You didn't have time to look back on it. 26 years. Like well, it's obviously a very emotional time, which I hadn't really thought about much. Um, I do a lot of work um, for veterans organizations. I'm, I'm the uh, I'm one of the officers in the VFW in Leesburg. Um, I have my own airplane, so I fly. Uh, in 2005, 2006 time frame, I got involved with Veterans Airlift Command, uh, flying veterans around to medical appointments. I would fly to the middle of the country and pick some National Guard guy up who was coming to some special institute. TBI became an enormous issue in the, in the early 2000s or mid 2000s because we developed the mine resistant ambush protective vehicle. Well, that's great. Now the guys are living through it, but they 
their brains have turned to jelly because of the concussion. Um, I flew a lot of guys around that have been injured in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and they didn't really dawn on me while I was doing that until I realized that one of the big outcomes of having been a combat veteran is understanding that being a combat veteran is different than anything else anybody will ever do. I mean, you hang around the VFW, you and I talked about Colonel Bob Shawn. Um, all Bob Shawn will talk about is all the funny head. But you know, and, and there are times when Bob has told me, well, yeah, let me tell you about some of the sucky stuff that happened. Um, and I heard my father at one point, um, after my grandfather passed away, he got with my two uncles, and the next thing you know, the war stories are coming out. And they're talking about some really crappy stuff. If you've never been there, you can't understand it. You don't know what it feels like, and you don't understand the stress that it causes. Um, so I find myself doing a lot of things to help veterans, working veterans' right. issues, um, hauling people around the country. You don't understand how war impacts somebody until you volunteer for a veterans' airlift commission to, to give a guy and his new bride a ride home from South Carolina back up here to Walter Reed, where he's getting fitted for his next prosthetic leg. Um, they got married right before they deployed, but they had the big wedding, threw him in the airplane. He's sitting up front, and here's this 26-year-old sitting there, and he says, God, my foot is driving me crazy and he pulls the sock down takes the prosthetic sticks it in the back seat his wife grabs it and he's scratching his stump and I said your foot itches he said yeah my foot itches all the time and he's scratching the stump at his knee and you go okay you know my life isn't all that bad um, and I talked to his wife afterwards and she said the big thing she noticed when he came back was the thousand yard stare sometimes he would just kind of fade out it, my combat experience was relatively limited. It was a week-long war. I mean, we deployed for five months, but it was a week-long war, and I look at what these kids are doing now, and I think, well, they got it way worse. The other thing that I find at work is that uh, there's a lot of stuff that goes by in meetings I just don't get excited about. Right. And people look at me and they say, well, that guy was kind of pretty rude. And I'm thinking, yeah, he's not shooting at me, so, right. you know, this will pass. We'll get past this. It's not that big a deal. Um, and that came really, really clear. I got involved in a startup a few years ago, and the CEO and I finally just couldn't work together any longer, and we're now negotiating our departure. And uh, he would get all excited about stuff and start losing his temper, and I would go into his office afterwards and say, dude, stop losing your temper in a business meeting. There's nothing to get upset about. Right. Well, this guy didn't do his job. Like, yeah, okay. But nobody's shooting at you, right. so it's no big deal. And that eventually drove a wedge between us because he felt like I was holding it over him that I was a combat veteran. He wasn't. Okay, maybe it allows you to put did. life into perspective. I guess what's important and what's not really that important yep. when you've been in combat. Yeah, I mean, if, if nobody's shooting at you and you're not worried about the chemical alarm going off, right. and you get home in time to hold your baby, right? Pretty good. Yeah, life's pretty good. Pretty good. Um, anything you'd like somebody to know who might be seeing this video? 20, 30, 40 years down the road? Yeah, I only did this video because there was a gun pointed at my head. <laughs> I, I didn't want to do it. No, just kidding. Um, no, I, I just think that it, it, the nation is in an interesting position today. And one of the things you realize when you get older is you realize that historical perspective gives you a different view of the world than a lot of people have. I listen to young people today and I, I hear them railing on about how this is wrong in the world and that's wrong in the world. And I realize that they weren't 10 years old when they heard their grandfather that they didn't have the experience I had when I was 10 uh, or when I was six years I remember when I was six or seven years old walking back into the house in Virginia Beach when we were down to visit my, my mother's the original liberal New York Democrat walking into the house saying you know my grandfather was out there talking to the the guy who's helping doing the lawn work and he was calling him the n-word what does that mean and got smacked I can still feel it on the side of my cheek she said, don't you ever use that word again. Um, and realizing that we've come a long way. I gave the Memorial Day address in Leesburg this year. And one of the things that I left people with is a challenge to continue on with the work that these veterans have done, the veterans that have gone before us, because Memorial Day is about right. remembering those who have given their lives. Right. And, I re and I referenced things that a few people picked up, but I wasn't, I was subtle for the first time in my life. I didn't exactly beat him over the head with it. And I said, you know, think about the history of our nation. Think about the things that have happened right here on these steps and in this courtyard, standing at the Loudoun County Courthouse 
where slaves were sold in the 1800s. And I said, think about the progress we've made, but don't accept that, move on. And I realized that as I've gotten older and, and, and having seen, I've been in 14 countries, I've lived in three. Um, I talk to people who have never lived outside the United States who tell me how bad life is, and I look at them and say, you have no clue what you're talking about. You really are clueless. You need to go travel, you need to understand what other people deal with in their lives, and you need to have been to East Germany. The single biggest political education I ever got was going to East Berlin in 1986. My girlfriend and I, yeah, the girl I was dating at the time, and I went over there. And of course in 1986 I had to go in uniform, and I had to have orders, and I had to go through Checkpoint Charlie. And I saw the difference between totalitarianism and free right. enterprise. Right. I saw the gray drab buildings, the lack of cars, the people who weren't happy, the crappy service, just people living in a prison. And I saw the other side of the prison wall. Do you know the Berlin Wall on the east side was completely clean, except for the blood stains. Yeah. There was no graffiti. Go to the other side and there's all that beautiful graffiti that says, hey, we're free and we can get away with this. So three years later, my buddy and I went over there and uh, before I went to Desert Storm and we, we uh, rode the S-Bahn mm -hmm. to the east side, which we couldn't do then, back in 86. And we walked back through the Brandenburg Gate from the Alexander Platz, which we couldn't have done three years earlier. Right. And we high-fived each other on the other side, and we said, hey, we won. We outspent them. I think everybody needs to have gone through that to truly understand the difference between a free country and one that isn't free. Yeah. Is there anything we haven't talked about that you want to mention? Or yeah. Got everything? Got it all, man. All right. Well, I want to thank you for sitting down with us, even though you did have a gun pointed at your head. And <laughs> <laughs> no gun. It was our, it no was our pleasure to do the interview. And all right. Thank thanks, man. Thank you very much for your service to your country. You bet.